If you will, go ahead and take your Bibles tonight and turn to Matthew chapter 25. And we are going to begin our study at verse number 30 in just a few moments. Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 30. Appreciate the singing that has been done tonight, the songs that have been led. Appreciate the prayer that was led just a few moments ago. Uh, thank you once again so much for the invitation to come and to be a part of your gospel meeting effort that you've got going on this week at Morrison. I have been looking forward to it so much, and I hope that you have been looking forward to our time and enjoying our time that we've had together uh, this week. Appreciate Chris and Danielle and uh, the, the deacons for the wonderful meal and fellowship that we were able to, uh, to have over at the Perry's house today. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, the company that I had while I was eating, uh, Marion included, but uh, uh, really enjoyed being with uh, uh, the brethren here tonight and uh, the workers, your, your special servants that you have working here and appreciate uh, so very much the good work that they are doing. We have had a number of visitors from the community uh, each day and we are thankful so much once again for those visitors that are here tonight. And uh, one visitor in particular, about 19 years ago, he made a phone call to me and said, uh, Robert, you've been selected as the new uh, minister uh, for the Smyrna Church of Christ in McMinnville. And uh, that brother is here tonight. His name is James Milstead. And uh, I am so thankful that, uh, that James is here. Thankful so much for uh, the relationship that we have had for, uh, for many years now. We've, we go back... Uh, that time and uh, whenever I am blessed and privileged to come back to this area, James is always very gracious to come back and to come out to the various places and uh, visit with me for a few moments and uh, I appreciate that uh, so very much and I'm thankful that he's here tonight. I really wish that my family could be here with me this week. They always enjoy their time when they get to come to, uh, to Warren County. Uh, several of you have asked uh, things pertaining to my family throughout the course of the, uh, of the week, and I thought I would give you just a, a few things tonight. Last night, Chris mentioned something that uh, was very, very interesting about the, the first night that Blair and I interacted with each other, if, if, you, can, uh, if you can call it that. But I remember visiting the Forest Hill congregation on a Wednesday night. Normally, I would go to Stage Road, my home church, on Wednesday night since I was from the Memphis area. But uh, this one particular Wednesday night, I decided to go to Forest Hill and visit over there. And I was sitting with Chris. And uh, just so happened, there was this really, really good-looking girl that walked in. And I leaned over to him, and I said, who is that? And uh, he said, I have no idea. You know, he only had eyes for Danielle. And uh, I, I, I said, who is that? And uh, he said, this is the first time I've ever seen her here. And so this was really the first time I'd gone to Forest Hill on Wednesday night. It was her first time. Well, I didn't speak to her that night. I didn't speak to her the next Wednesday night either. But uh, uh, that, that first Wednesday night, uh, I, it was, for me, it was kind of love at first sight. But uh, I, I started scoping her around and doing some kind of investigation throughout the course of the next week. Well, she came back to services that next Wednesday night, and there was a group of, of preacher students and college-age kids, and we were all talking together, and she was over there among the group, and we had decided that night we were going to go eat at Perkins afterwards. And I just took a chance. Really, this is something that's outside of my comfort zone, something I'd never done before. And, and I said, uh, would you like to ride with me to Perkins tonight? And uh, she said, I don't normally get into the car with strangers. But she said, uh, you're a preacher student. You, uh, you basically seem kind of harmless kind of thing. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, I'll give it a shot. And so she rode with me over to Perkins. And as Dan, or Chris mentioned last night, I was frozen the whole time. I, I am a shy person at heart, and uh, I, I was just mesmerized that night, uh, sitting there with them, and, and really didn't say a word. I'm thankful that Danielle didn't run her off that night, but uh, Danielle did all of the talking uh, for me, and uh, afterwards that night, dinner was over with. There, evidently, there was another guy that had his eye on her too, and there was a group that was going to the movie theater, 
some movie was, was playing that night. Well, the preacher students, we had to go back and study. And uh, there was this guy that, uh, that asked her, would you like to go to the movies with us tonight? And I thought, man, you've got a lot of nerve mo moving in uh, that quick. And, and she said, well, I came with Bobby tonight. She said, I'm going I'm to let him take me back to my car and, and uh, that kind of thing. And so we got back to her car and I asked her if she'd like to go out again. And, and the rest is kind of uh, a history from there. But we have been married now 18 years, going on 19 this year. We have three wonderful children. Our, uh, our oldest, our daughter, she is 11. Her name is Aylin. Uh, she'll be turning 12 uh, in just the next month in May. And then uh, our oldest son, he's eight years old. His name is Hilton. And then our youngest son, his name is Weston. He's six years old. And if, if our kids were with us this week, if, if you saw Weston, it'd be nothing but a blur. Uh, Weston has one speed, and it is go, and it's as fast as he can go at all times. Um, but uh, this week they had school, some obligations there. Uh, Blair, she also coaches uh, five soccer teams. I think she's nuts doing that. But uh, she coaches uh, all three of our kids' teams, and then she coaches two state recreational uh, soccer teams that they're preparing for a tournament in Starkville, Mississippi in the next couple of weeks. And so uh, she's there preparing for that right now. But uh, I really wish that they could be here with us this week. So that's just kind of a little bit of background, a little bit of a rundown of, uh, of my family. But uh, I am thankful to be here with my extended family this week, uh, too, to get to be with Chris and Danielle. There is a subject that is really neglected in many pulpits today. There are a number of preachers who will refuse to preach on this particular subject. But I believe if an individual is going to preach the whole counsel of God... This is a subject that needs to be taught on and it needs to be taught on with regularity. And that is the subject of hell. I have always believed in my ministry, if you preach on heaven, you better preach on hell too. You've got to have a balance there. The Northwestern University did a study about 20 years ago and they interviewed preachers of all backgrounds pertaining to Christianity. They interviewed 500 different preachers all across the country. They had several questions that they would ask them as part of this questionnaire. And one of the questions was this, Do you believe in the place called hell? 69% of those preachers said that they believed in hell. 31%. We're talking about preachers here said that they didn't believe in hell. The next question was this. Those of you that believe in hell, how many of you ever preach on the subject? 80% said that they would not touch the subject, that they would not preach on it. There was one preacher that with this study, he, he mentioned, he said, you know, could I make a few comments in regards to the questions that you're asking? And they said, sure. And he said, I personally believe that one of the reasons why our country is the way that it is today as far as morality is concerned versus about 60, 70 years ago is because we have neglected to preach on this particular subject right here with regularity. Brethren and friends, we have to be reminded this is not a popular subject. I was asked tonight at the dinner table what, what we were going to be studying about tonight. And uh, when the question was first asked, I, I swallowed for a moment and I took a deep breath and I just looked and I said, hell. And uh, it got very quiet in the room. But if we're going to study about heaven, we've got to study about hell too. And we need to know what God's Word has to say about this subject. This week we are looking at eternal truths that are designed to motivate us to remain faithful. And on Sunday morning we talked about the importance of remaining faithful to our personal Bible study. On Sunday morning for our worship hour we looked at five basic Bible truths that will motivate us. Sunday afternoon we talked about the love of God from the book of 1 John. On Monday night, we talked about the cross. On Tuesday night, we talked about heaven. 
Some may be asking, why do you keep repeating yourself each night? I, I firmly believe in the three laws of learning, repetition, repetition, repetition. And so I like to remind us each night where we've been and where we're heading to in this series of lessons. And so tonight, for the next few moments, I want us to consider three things that the Word of God shares with us about the place called hell. And before we look at these three things, we've got to remember and understand that hell is not just a figment of our imagination. You know, the devil could not be any happier than when he sees people simply reduce hell to nothing more than a cuss word in society. I think that makes him extremely happy to get it out of our minds, to, to, to get it as far away as possible. But tonight, let, let's consider three things that the book, that God's Word has to say about this subject. Number one, let's talk about the description. As we think about the way hell is described, sometimes there are individuals, religious people, that will say, just give me the words in red in this book. And, and, and what they believe is that the words in red, you know, those are the ones that were spoken by Jesus, those particular words, that they're, they're words that are filled with nothing but love and grace and mercy, and they are, but in their minds that they're nothing but encouraging statements. They're nothing but pats on the back. That They're nothing but pep talks. Evidently, these same individuals haven't read Matthew chapter 23. They haven't gone through and, and noticed the, the word that Jesus will use over and over and over again as He's talking to those religious people there. But did you know this? Did you know that out of the 12 times that the eternal abode, the eternal place of hell is referenced in the New Testament, that Jesus is the one who references that place 11 of the 12 times? That's interesting to note. 11 of the 12 times. Why do you suppose he spoke about this place perhaps more than any other because Jesus wants us to stay as far away from this place as possible. And when Jesus spoke about this place, He's going to give some very, very graphic descriptions pertaining to it. When Jesus spoke about hell, and He was referring to the eternal place for our soul, Jesus would choose the Greek word Gehenna. And that word was originally taken from the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was one of the two major valleys that ran outside of the city of Jerusalem. We read about this valley in 2 Chronicles. We read about it in 2 Kings. You can read about this valley in, in, in the book of Jeremiah. But the people of our Lord's day, they knew all about this place. You see, this was the place that followers of Baal, idolatrous Jews, and also those who worship Canaanite gods, their followers, they would bring their children to the Valley of Hinnom and they would sacrifice their children to their various little G gods. The Valley of Hinnom was known as the place of burning. Some called it the stove of burning. You could smell the burning flesh for miles away. Now why would Jesus choose this particular word to describe the place called hell? Because there was no other word in the first century in their language to bring more horrific and terrible thoughts to their minds. That's the reason why Jesus chose this word. 
This particular word here, you know, we talked about on um, Sunday afternoon, I believe it was, when we began that study today, we, that day, we talked about how there are a number of great words that we read about in the Word of God. And, and when we think about those words, they bring a lot, a lot of wonderful thoughts to our mind, don't they? Well, there are some words that we can read about that don't bring wonderful thoughts to our minds. And if you were a first century listener, if you heard the word Gehenna, that was an attention-getting word. And that's the reason why Jesus would choose this word. But I want us to consider for the next few moments how hell is described. What kind of descriptive terms will he use? Number one, hell is a place of pain. It's designed to be a place of pain. When you look at Matthew 25 and verse number 30, Jesus would, would speak these words. Here he's speaking as part of his parabolic teaching, and he says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One of the ways that he describes hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, over the past few days, since we started talking about the cross, and then even last night talking about heaven, we've talked about two different types of pain, haven't we? We've made reference to emotional pain. We've made reference to physical pain. When we look at Matthew 25 and verse number 30, when it comes to hell, there's going to be emotional pain. He says there's going to be weeping that is there. There's going to be crying. Remember in heaven, there's not going to be any more tears. But in heaven, this is going to be a place where there will be a lot of tears that will be shed. But then at number two, there's going to be physical pain. There is gnashing of teeth. How many of you have ever gotten a paper cut before? Or, or maybe you were, were, uh, were hammering a nail and instead of hitting the the, uh, the nail on the head, you hit your finger or your thumb. What, what did you do? Hopefully you didn't say anything that you're not supposed to say, but maybe you did something like this. You know what you just did there? You gnashed your teeth. Do you know that historians have found various artifacts from the Civil War? And some of the artifacts that they have found are pieces of wood with teeth impressions in them. Why would they have teeth impressions? Well, back during this time with the, these soldiers that were fighting in the Civil War, you know what they didn't have like we have today? They didn't have this thing called anesthesia. Go to the hospital, you need a surgery, you want to be knocked out for that surgery, don't you? You don't want to feel a thing, especially while that doctor is cutting on you. Those surgeons... At that time, they didn't have anesthesia like we have to do. So you know what they would give them for their anesthesia? Here's a board, bite down. Imagine the gnashing of teeth that's going on as you are being operated on, as your bones and your flesh is, is being cut, and that's all that you have to try to take this pain away. Imagine spending eternity in a place like that where it's going to be this continual physical and emotional pain that, that you're going to be feeling. Number two, when we think about how hell is described, it's a place that is prepared. We talked about heaven as a place that's prepared, John chapter 14. But when we think about hell, it's a prepared place too. When you go there to Matthew 25, drop down to verse number 41, he says that it's prepared for who? The devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for us. God doesn't want us to go there. According to 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 4, who will have all men to be saved, coming to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Peter 3, 9, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God's desire is, is for us to be with him. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be with him as we noted the other day. And so when we think about hell, it's a place of pain. It's a place that's prepared. But, but hell is also described as a place of fire. 
Over and over and over again, you will see hell described in the New Testament this particular way. When you look at Matthew chapter 5, verse number 22, there it's described as hell fire. When you look over at Matthew chapter 13, there it's described as a furnace of fire. You look in Revelation chapter 20, he describes it there as a lake of fire. Do you know of anybody that's ever been burned by fire? Fire's one of the most destructive things, isn't it? Causes a lot of pain. You may know some people that have suffered second and perhaps even third degree burns. Do you know that according to one study that I was, was reading, our fire chief in here, he might, uh, uh, he might uh, say that it, I might be off on this, but according to one study that I read about fires, that fire burns somewhere between 750 to 5,000 degrees depending on the fire. I want you to think about that for a moment. I don't like 100 degree days. That, that's not me. I, I am a very hot natured individual. Hell would not be enjoyable for me for that very fact. I, I do not like those days. I don't like 90 degree days. 80 degree days, we're pushing it. I like it between 55 and 70. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer you can put clothes on, but there's only so much that you can take off. Okay? So with, with that in mind, this would not be enjoyable at all. Do you think that it's supposed to be an enjoyable place? Not it's supposed to make us feel comfortable. There's going to be a lot of pain that's involved with it, if nothing else, because of how hot the place is going to be. When you look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 20, there he describes it this way. He describes it as a place of darkness. And he uses another descriptive word with it. He describes it as outer darkness. Not just darkness, but outer darkness. Most in here have probably been to Cumberland Caverns sometime. And you've had that, that director take you, the tour guide take you through that cave. And they get you back there to a certain part of the cave and what do they do? They flip the light switch off, don't they? You ever tried to see your hand in front of your face when they turned that switch off? It's practically impossible, isn't it? We could turn all the lights off in this room tonight, and I think we probably would still be able to see just a little bit. But imagine, imagine this. Imagine that you're hearing weeping and gnashing of teeth. Imagine how hot this place is, and you can't see anything around you. Do you know that, that sometimes when, it's, when the sun has gone down and it's nighttime, we tend to be a little bit more on guard? And the reason for that is because we can't see our surroundings. Just the other day, there was one of our elderly ladies at South Haven. She was concerned about some of the spring storms that were coming in, and she said, I do not like it when those storms come at night. I said, I don't either. She said, I'd rather them come during the day where I can see what's going on. I said, I do too. When you go back to the Old Testament, what was one of the plagues? It was the plague of darkness, wasn't it? And you think about the, the darkness that came upon those, those Egyptians. Why is that? God knew. God knew what comes with darkness. He knows the fears that come with it. Did you know that according to various studies on the subject of, of things that people are afraid of, darkness is a legitimate fear? especially among children. Our youngest son, Weston, he likes to have the stairs light on at nighttime. Makes him feel a little bit more comfortable, not quite as dark. And he's done that since he was probably two or three years old. We'd put him in bed. Daddy, will you turn the light on on the stairs? Sure. Well, there are some nights that Weston is not quite ready to go to sleep. 
And his room is, is right over the kitchen. And many times during the school year, I'm making his lunch at, at nighttime for the next day. And you know what I hear? I hear pitter-patter of feet up there. And you know what I'll do to get his attention? I'll walk right over to the wall and I'll flip that switch. A few minutes later, I'll hear him running down the hallway. You know what he'll do? He'll go right over there to that switch and he'll flip it back up. You know what I start to do now? I sit on the stairs and I wait on him to come running. And we've got an agreement. You know what that agreement is? Son, if you go to bed, this light can stay on. If you want to stay up and play, this light goes off. He's not going to play while it's dark up there. So you know what he does? He starts walking back to bed and he'll get in his bed. He's got his attention. Darkness is an attention getter. Jesus described hell as a place of outer darkness to get our attention when he described it. But as we think about the descriptions, there's one other one that I want us to consider, and that is that hell is a place without rest. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at verse number 11, and notice what John writes here. He says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. I love rest. Okay? I, I like to make sure that I get my sleep each night, even if it's just a few hours. I, I am wired where I need sleep. But how many of you, when you get up in the morning time, that one of your first thoughts is, I can't wait to get back in this bed again? You ever have that? Well, when I get our boys up, Blair's already off, and uh, she's a school bus driver, and so she's already off uh, driving before, uh, before we get up. But when I get our boys up, one of the first thoughts that comes to my mind is, I can't wait to get back in this bed and go to sleep again. All right, because I enjoy rest. On Sunday afternoon, guess what I want to do? I want to take a nap. I want to get a little bit of rest. A after a, a hard day of work, what's one of the things that you want to do? You want to spend some time resting. Imagine a place in eternity where there is no rest. You never, ever have any type of let up. But drop down just two verses. And, and he talks about those that go to heaven. Guess what they get? They get to rest from their labors. It, it's almost like he's given a comparison here. One place you've got no rest. The other place you've got rest. Which one sounds better? Oh, I, I want to go to that place that's got rest. And so number one, when we think about hell, we see the descriptions but number two, let's notice the demographics. And when we talk about demographics, we're simply looking at an analysis of, of society or an analysis of group of people. And it's going to be broken down in various ways. Sometimes it's, it's broken down based upon age, religious background. It can be based upon a person's ethnicity. It, it can be based upon income levels. If you've ever gone and, uh, on the internet and done something like uh, city data, you, you can look at various cities around the country and you can see a breakdown of all different types of things. Who makes up this particular town? Well, when we think about hell, who is going to make up this place? The PowerPoint that I have for this particular lesson, it shows uh, I've got a graph that we put up there. It looks kind of like a pie chart. And we just kind of go around that wheel and we see who is there. I want you to notice with me for just a moment who is in this place, what the Scriptures have to teach. Number one, the Bible tells us that those who have not obeyed. When you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 8, he says, "...in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God." There's really two classes of people here. Number one, those who are ignorant. But then he says, "...and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." He says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? 
So when we think about who's going to be there, number one, those who haven't obeyed. Number two, those who are immoral. Let's go back to Revelation 21 and let's look at verse number 8. We referenced this passage last night, but let's go back there for just a moment. And he says here, the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Sounds like some pretty immoral people, doesn't it? Those who continue to practice those things, we reference 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Those are the kinds of people that are going to be there. Number three, stay there in Revelation 21, 8, because there's a third type of people that will be there, and it's those who are fearful. And I mentioned to you last night that we were going to talk about this word a little bit more but when I see that word fearful there in Revelation 21, I think about it in two ways. Number one, I think about those who are too afraid to obey the gospel of Christ. You remember in John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, that Jesus talked about those who were too afraid to confess Him. They were worried about what others had to say. For me personally, I think confession was the most difficult command to follow in the first century. I don't believe that, especially in our country today, that that's the most, the most difficult one to follow. But you see, when you think about confession, it wasn't just making some verbal statement. It was confessing Him with their life too. But because of the consequences, they weren't interested in making that confession. It was too great. Number two, I think about fearful this way. I think about those who have obeyed the gospel, but they're too afraid to live for Jesus. They're too afraid at work to let their Christianity be seen. They're too afraid when they go to school to let others know that they are a Christian and to live like a Christian. They're too afraid when they're around their family members. They're too afraid when they're on their ball teams. You know what John tells us? He says the fearful... Those are going to be part of the demographic that makes up this place called hell. Number four, another group that we see there are those who have become unfaithful. When you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, you look at verses 20 through 22. You remember what Peter spoke about there? He says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... They've become entangled therein once again. That escaping the pollutions of the world, these are individuals who have left sin. These are the people who have obeyed the gospel and they've had their sins washed away. Now they're entangled therein. He says they're overcome and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Sometimes people ask, are there degrees of punishment? According to 2 Peter 2, 20-22, there are going to be different degrees of punishment. And the ones who are going to receive the worst degree of punishment are those who one time were following the Lord and being faithful to Him and those who have turned their back on Him. That's one thing that we don't want to do. And that's part of the reason why we're having this series of lessons this week looking at different subjects to encourage us to remain faithful to the Lord because we don't dare want to turn our back on Him. But number five, religious people are going to be part of that demographic. When you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Who was he speaking to there on that occasion? People who were religious. There are a number of religious people that are out there today that think that all that they have to say is just, just make this belief and, and that's it. That's what's going to be pleasing to God. They haven't read their scriptures. They haven't read what God's word has to say. You see, Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You see, there's obedience that must follow. There was a denominational book that was put out several years ago, and I realize we have to be careful when we talk about denominational books and material along that line. But a very popular mainstream book the title of it was called The Christian Atheist. Some of you may have heard of that book before. 
But I really love the synopsis of the book. A Christian atheist, I realize that that may sound contradictory, and, and really it is. But here's what a Christian atheist is. It's somebody who believes that there is a God, but lives as if there is no God. You know any people like that? They believe that there's a God, but they live like there is no God. There are a number of religious people that fall into that category. But Jesus tells us that that demographic is going to make up this place called hell. Tonight, we've looked at the descriptions. But then, number two, we've looked at the demographic. Let's close tonight with our final point by looking at the duration of this place. When we think about the duration of hell, the Scriptures do not leave us in the dark. They share quite a bit of information about this. You know, there are some groups today that will teach that, that hell is only short-lived. That it's only this temporary place that we go to, and then we get to leave, we get to go to heaven. There are some religious groups that teach this thing known as annihilation. And it's unfortunate that there are some who are members of the Lord's church that are buying into this mess today too. But you need to be careful because it's nothing but an easy way out. It's comforting doctrine to think about, but it's not a doctrine that can be backed up by this book right here. You see, annihilation, the idea is, is if we don't prepare ourselves while we're here, we just cease to exist. That sounds comforting, doesn't it? I don't get it right here. Okay. You know, I'm just going to cease to exist. Don't buy into that. That's not found in this book. Number two, there's something known as purgatory. And purgatory basically is, is that God will sentence us, the Lord will sentence us to a certain period of time. But after that period of time is over with, then we get to go and experience the joys of heaven with the rest of the people that are there. I don't read that in my Bible either. This same particular religious group for many years taught something known as the selling of indulgences, which basically means that you can pay a certain amount of money for loved ones that have gone on that have been unprepared, and depending on the amount of money that you pay, it will reduce their eternal sentence, so to speak. This particular religious group has built beautiful cathedrals and chapels all over the world from the collection of those monies. You can't read about that in the scriptures either. But here's what the Word of God has to say. The Bible tells us that this place is going to have everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, verse 46. And many times where this, these false doctrines originate is right there in that chapter. We mentioned on Sunday morning how that he talks about everlasting punishment but life eternal. But I mentioned to you the same Greek word is used for both of those, which means there is no end. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Maybe this group of people on this side says, you know, we've got 75 cars in the parking lot tonight. But this group over here, this side says, We've got 75 automobiles in the parking lot tonight. Are we talking about the same thing? We're meaning the same thing, aren't we? We're just using two different English words to describe it. That, that's, that's the idea of Matthew 25, 46. Same Greek word, same meaning to the word, just two different words being used. And so everlasting punishment. When you look at Matthew 18 and verse number 8, we read about everlasting fire. When you go back there to 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 9, we read about everlasting punishment. When you go over to Revelation chapter 20, we're going to be tormented day and night forever. That, that means that it's never ever going to end. And then when you look at Mark chapter 9 verse number 48, there's this unquenchable fire. A fire that's never able to be put out. It just keeps, it's like the Energizer Bunny. It keeps going and going and going. That's the description. When we think about the duration of hell from this book right here. When we think about 
eternity. And something lasting forever, it's difficult for our minds to really grasp that, isn't it? But we might say that this is, but we might say that, that uh, you know, a person as slow as Christmas. You might say that this is, is, is an eternity. I've got to wait an eternity for that to happen. You might be thinking this sermon is lasting for an eternity tonight. Do you know that when you get older, the days, they start getting quicker and quicker. Those birthdays, they they start coming faster and faster. At least it seems that way, doesn't it? But when you're little, Bennett just celebrated a birthday the other day. When I was his age... One of the things that I would think about is after that birthday was celebrated, I've got to wait 365 more days for the next birthday. All right? Any of y'all ever ever thought that way? Okay? And it just seems like it's forever until I'm going to be that next age. Let me give you a picture of eternity. Suppose for just a moment that there was a bird that had this job, and its job was to start at the very tip top of the coastline in the state of Maine. And that bird was to take a grain of sand, and the job that it was assigned, that it was trained to do, was to take that grain of sand and fly all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and drop that grain of sand on the western shoreline of Europe fly all the way back, and to do that over and over and over again until it got down to the bottom portion of the state of Florida and every single grain of sand had been taken and deposited on the western shoreline of Europe. Somebody says that would take forever. Do you know once that bird did that, eternity would have just begun? That, that's, that's the idea. It's, it's never designed to end. There's never going to be any let up to the torment. As we close tonight. By a show of hands, how many of you remember milk cartons from years ago where you would see a picture of a missing person on the back? Anyone in here remember those? Okay, That was actually before my time. When, uh, when I was growing up, one of the things that, that we would get, I heard about those things, but one of the things that we would get in the mail, we always called it the junk mail, but in the Memphis area, we had this piece of junk mail that was called, um, that, that was put out by the company called Advo, but it says, Advo asked, have you seen me? And they would have a picture of a missing person on the back of it, just like those milk cartons, and then they would give a description. This is where this child was last seen. This is what this child was wearing. This is what their birthday is. This is how old they would be now and and things along that line. This is who they were, were with last. Now, whenever you looked at that milk carton or you saw that piece of of junk mail, did you ever just kind of glance at it and read at it? But then, for maybe just for a moment, your heart went out to the family. Then you put it back in. The refrigerator, you took that piece of junk mail and you threw it in the trash and you didn't give another thought to it. But what about this? What if you looked at that milk carton, you looked at that piece of junk mail, and it was somebody that you knew? It was the family member, the friend who was missing, or or the person missing was a close family member or a close friend. What if you knew that person? What would you do? Would you make it personal? We'd start acting on it then, wouldn't we? We would start searching and helping that family do whatever we could to help find that missing loved one. When it comes to the subject of hell, do you know what we've got to do? We've got to start making it personal. We've got to start seeing this place as God sees it. Because there are people that we work with. There are people that we go to school with. People that we drink coffee with. People that we shop with. People that we play golf with, hunt with, fish with. Some of those people may be lost. 
And they're in need of the gospel of Christ. What are we doing to help rescue them from this terrible place called hell? Tonight, if you have never been obedient to the gospel, you're not promised another five minutes. And that means that you and I both need to make sure that we're prepared at all times so that we don't go to this terrible place known as hell. Tonight we have looked at the descriptions. We've looked at the duration. We've talked about the demographics. Have you done the necessary things to make sure that heaven is your home and that hell is not? The Bible tells us that if we'll believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, 24, if we'll repent of our sins, Acts 17 and verse number 30, if we'll make the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and if we'll be baptized so that our sins can be washed away, Acts 22, 16, we can leave here tonight as one of His children. But please understand, as we've mentioned this week, that's only the beginning. That's not the end. And God expects you and I to remain faithful to Him. Maybe you're here tonight. You have been obedient. But as you examine yourself, you realize, I'm not prepared. If death were to come or if the Lord were to return. And I'm ready this evening through repentance and prayer, 1 John 1 verses 6 through 9, to make sure that I'm ready. Because I want heaven to be my home. I don't want any part of that place that we've studied about tonight. If you're subject to heaven's invitation, whether it's in obedience to the gospel or whether it's in coming back to the fold, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing.